The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. These are the last three verses of the book of Ecclesiastes. I want to welcome you to our study for tonight. We're continuing in this search, this quest for wisdom and opening a new book this evening, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, which I don't know, maybe one that you haven't spent a lot of time in, uh, maybe even a little bit difficult for us to find because we turn there so infrequently. But if you know where Psalms is, so you have Psalms, then Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes. And uh, those last three verses, chapter 12, verses 13, uh, verses 12, 13, and 14 are some of the most well-known verses most often quoted from Ecclesiastes. But they have a context, and we'll talk about that as we go. Uh, in, in what we've studied so far, Ecclesiastes is different. It is unique. It is uh, one of the most unique books in the Bible. If you remember back when we were just sort of introducing the wisdom books we talked about the different approach toward wisdom, uh, toward uh, trying to understand God's mind and, and, uh, and plan. Um, we talked about how, uh, for instance, the book of Job approached it. Job is a story. Uh, we described it as a man on an adventure with God who um, discovers new things about God, and that's the way he, he arrives at new wisdom. And then with Proverbs, we talked about how optimistically Proverbs approaches uh, the plan or the wisdom. It states wisdom in very bold, uh, matter-of-fact, brief terms. Um, it, it feels like uh, you can discover wisdom and you can state it uh, confidently and concisely, and it's something that can be relied on, counted on. When we come to Ecclesiastes, uh, we find that it is much more pessimistic uh, about being able to really discover the wisdom of God and the plan of God. And uh, it says, you know, there is something out there, there is wisdom but it's obscured it's obscured by this thing called vanity and uh, if you can somehow peer through that thick mist of vanity maybe you can figure some things out now that's talking in broad strokes of course but it is a different kind of book so I want us to begin just talking a little bit about uh, what is Ecclesiastes um, do we have any idea where it came from and how is it organized? That'll be about all we have time for tonight. Um, and then we'll spend a little bit more time in, in various texts next time. But, uh, you know, a lot of people look at Ecclesiastes as sort of the black sheep of the Bible in one sense. Um, it's been classified by some as pessimism literature. Um, some say there are contradictions in it, that there are even unorthodox statements in it. It can be almost rambling at times in the way it um, discusses wisdom and um, it repeats itself, you know, and in a lot of ways it's a shocking book. And uh, shocking, we're not used to this kind of these kinds of things being said in Scripture. For instance, uh, just as an illustration, in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, the writer says, Then I said in my heart, What happens to the fool will happen to me also. Now, uh, we're familiar with the fool, having gone through a lot of the Proverbs, but uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, What happens to the fool will happen to me. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. 
For, for of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten how the wise dies just like the fool. Now, you wouldn't find anything like that in the book of Proverbs, would you? Uh, same thing's going to happen to the wise as happens to the fool. No, Proverbs would say the fool's going to his ruin and the wise will be blessed and, and enriched and taken care of by God. Uh, but you, you have this strange statement here uh, in, in, in Ecclesiastes. Similar thing over in chapter 7, verse 16. Uh, be not, now imagine this being in the Bible. Did you know this was in the Bible? Chapter 7, verse 16 of Ecclesiastes. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Well, that doesn't sound like it belongs in the wisdom literature compared to uh, other things we've read and come to expect in these books. Uh, and so sometimes what we read in Ecclesiastes shocks us. Um, in another, uh, in another sense, Ecclesiastes is a very contemporary book. It is, uh, you know, it has an, an expose of of things like sex, chapter two, verses one through eleven, of of work. In that same chapter, verses eighteen through twenty three, talks about things like education, education, and dealing with fame, and like Proverbs, it it talks about drink, strong drink. So there are several things that are sort of contemporary issues um, that we can find in the book. Uh, so it's a puzzling book. Let's, let's put it that way uh, to begin at least. Opening words of the book, chapter one, verse one, begins at least in the translation that I have and I'm using um, frequently, it says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So that's the opening of the book. And that really starts the questions right away. Um, and the question is, who, who is this? And have we really translated these words well? And uh, how do we understand what, what does it mean, the preacher? Or if you read other translations, it may say something different, the words of the teacher. Um, and uh, that's, that's sort of where we begin with the struggle, with a translation issue actually here at the beginning of Ecclesiastes. The Hebrew word in chapter 1, verse 1, that's translated preacher in the English Standard Version teacher and some others, is a word um, called or, or pronounced Kohelet. Uh, if you have a good translation, you may have a footnote there in verse 1 that takes you to the bottom of the page and says Hebrew says Kohelet. I thought I, I wrote some things down on the board for you. I'm going to see if I can, if I can do this right. Ah. There is the word written out, Kohelet. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. That is the, the original word that we're talking about. And frankly, I don't think our translations have done a very good job in rendering it. Maybe because it's one of those rare words we just don't know for sure how to translate. The word that it comes from originally means something like one who calls together, uh, one who creates an assembly, we might say, or, or could be one who collects. Now, what does he collect? Maybe anything. Uh, but the idea of one who calls together. And so uh, I think it's pretty clear that what we have here is not somebody's name. So there wasn't a fella named Kohelet or named the preacher or the teacher. It's a title. Uh, it's, it's the main voice of the book 
and his title is Kohelet, or, or preacher or teacher, however we want to render it. Uh, the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, uh, that's really where we get the title of the book Ecclesiastes, because the Greek rendering of Kohelet is Ecclesiastes, or Ecclesiasticus. And, and so that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew word. Um, sometimes our Old Testament book titles are actually Greek, even though the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And that comes through the, the Greek translation. So that's where we get Ecclesiastes. But this word in question, Kohelet, occurs about seven times in the course of the book. And uh, obviously here, chapter 1, verse 1. And then also in verse 2, notice it says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. That's, that's our term, Kohelet. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And then in, in verse 12 of the first chapter, it says, I, the preacher, that's our word again, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. That's three occurrences of the word. It also will occur once in chapter 7 and three times in the concluding chapter, chapter 12. Um, one place to look that might help us understand the meaning of the word best is where it occurs there in chapter 12, and uh, because it, it gives us a little context. So chapter 12, uh, the first place it appears in, is in verse 8, where it says, vanity of vanities. Hopefully you're seeing that that's a theme of the book, this word vanity. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Then verse 9, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. That may give us a little bit of a clue as to um, a better way, perhaps, to translate the word. Uh, maybe something like collector, although that may be, may be a little too clunky, uh, but it may be more accurate. Uh, the, the, this individual with the title Kohelet collects things. Maybe he collects an audience. Maybe he collects wisdom sayings, but he is a collector. And I have a problem with the translation preacher because we have associations with that word that really are not accurate for uh, what was going on in this ancient book. Um, same with the word teacher. Uh, this, this individual is a collector of some sort, although I'm not 100% satisfied with that translation either, but that may give us a better idea of the meaning. Anyway, that's where we start. Um, and, and, and so we sort of have to address it. Now there seems to be, and the next couple of things I want to go over really are keys to how I want to present the book. Okay, so if I put you to sleep already, wake up for a few minutes and really focus here on these next couple of things because these are interpretive keys and I have a little bit different view that you might, than you might have heard before to how to understand this book. Uh, it's really helped me understand and appreciate how it's organized. So let me try and present it to you. First thing, there seem to be two voices speaking in the book. Two voices, two distinct voices. Number one is this fellow, whoever he is, this person, Kohelet, all right? Kohelet. However we want to translate it or understand it, that's voice number one. Kohelet is a doubter. He is a skeptic. He's skeptical about life. He's not, you know, he's not optimistic like many of the Proverbs. He is pessimistic. He is a skeptic about things. And he speaks... Uh, beginning in chapter 1, verse 12, and then for the bulk of the book, all the way through chapter 12, verse 7. So if you're jotting down an outline, 
Uh, Kohelet speaks chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 12, verse 7. And there's just 12 chapters in the book, and so by far and away, his is the most prominent voice. And he's sort of describing his spiritual journey, his uh, search. Now, we're, we're talking about a sort of a quest for wisdom in these studies. Well, he's on a quest for meaning in life. And he's sort of describing that. Um, but keep in mind, he he's doubtful about whether he's going to find anything, and he's sort of skeptical about what he does find. This is the predominant voice in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, that might be troubling to think about it that way, but um, hear me out for a moment. The second voice that appears, we don't have a name for for this individual. Uh, we'll just call him the narrator. Now, the narrator seems to be more of a typical believer, uh, what we expect to find in the Bible, that kind of thing. The verses that we read at the very beginning uh, that come at the end of the book are from the narrator. He's more of an orthodox believer, we might say, and if you're going to get much positive teaching in this book, you're going to find it from his voice. Now, where do, you, where do we hear his voice? The narrator speaks at the very beginning and at the very end. So chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and chapter 12, verses 8 through 14. So the very beginning and the very end, the narrator speaks this more orthodox believer. Uh, and one of the things he does, <clears throat> which is something, if you studied with us in Proverbs, that we came to see, is he addresses it to his son. Whoever it is, he addresses it to his son. So chapter 12, verse 12, the, the, the narrator says, My son, beware of anything beyond these uh, and then he makes a statement about of the making of many books, there is no end, and so forth. But we, we, we saw that in Proverbs, didn't we? This, my son, listen to what I have to say kind of address. So, two voices uh, in the book. One uh, a, a sort of pessimistic, skeptical voice that speaks in the bulk of the book. That is the voice of Kohelet. Uh, the preacher, the teacher, whatever you want to call him, describing his spiritual journey, his search. Uh, and then voice number two, not near as much text devoted to, but at the very beginning, at the very end, this more orthodox believer who uh, teaches some positive kind of, of, of things. All right, so that's one way of thinking about how this book is organized. A second is with a little bit of an outline. And uh, the outline really is in concert with what we just gave you about the two voices. So we could divide the book into, into three basic parts. Uh, this will almost sound silly, I guess. Uh, the beginning, the middle, and the end. We'll say it this way. Uh, part one, prologue. That's verses 1 through 11 of chapter 1. Um, remember that lined up with the the narrator's voice. Uh, but in, in this section, the prologue, the, the person, whoever it is, Kohelet, is spoken of in the third person. So, um, for instance, at the beginning, uh, the words of the preacher, and then it says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. So, the preacher or Kohelet is sort of referred to in the third person in the prologue. Uh, that's as opposed to chapter 1, verse 12, where suddenly Kohelet, the preacher, is speaking in the first person. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And so there's a change in voice, a change in speaking there in verse 12, and that gets us to the main body, the second part of the outline, uh, the main body, and it runs 
all the way into chapter 12, chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 12, verse 8. And here it's sort of an autobiographical monologue uh, where this person, Kohelet, speaks in the first person, I, uh, I do this, or I said this. And uh, there is this thing that sort of wraps this whole section together. Um, and we've already read it in both places, but chapter 1, verse 2, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And then if you go clear to the end in chapter 12, and verse 8, you have the almost identical thing again. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Beginning and end. That, that, that refrain sort of wraps the book. Um, and, and so that sort of gives us the main part of the book. Prologue, main body, and then, as we might expect, an epilogue at the end. That's chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. Uh, and again, when we come to this ending section, Kohelet, suddenly the first person voice is gone, and he's spoken of once more in the third person. That is, he did this, he did that, or said this or that. I uh, jotted down this outline on the board, and what I'm, I think I'm going to try to do is take a photograph of that, and uh, tag that to the video. So you, if you want to have that written down, um, you can refer that, but pretty basic. Hopefully you could follow what we were doing there. So those are two really important parts in understanding the book. Um, the two voices and then the three parts as far as an outline. Let's talk a little bit also about the author. Uh, the author of Ecclesiastes. Uh, quickly stated, we don't know who it was. Um, that's often the case in the Old Testament. Uh, we don't know necessarily who authored every book. Uh, for this book, the author is not specifically named, although I think we could say it's strongly hinted that the author is Solomon. Uh, or at least he's the one responsible for the book because uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says he is the son of David, king in Jerusalem. That's not the only place it says that. So who would the son of David who is king in Jerusalem be other than Solomon? Uh, the question is, did he write the entire thing? Is... is uh, is it his voice all throughout? Uh, we don't know. If so, if the entire thing is to be credited to Solomon, he does use this very interesting and unique style of writing where he writes in two distinct voices that we've already described. Uh, another way we might look at it is that maybe Solomon authored the bulk of the book, that is that big middle part, chapter 1, verse 12 through chapter 12, verse 8. Maybe that's what's from Solomon directly. And then a, a later writer or another writer took that and commented upon it. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. And thus we get our two different voices. That's a possibility we don't know. Uh, or maybe something else is going on and we just don't know. We are not 100% sure about authorship. Uh, but that, that is something that people are often interested in. One other thing for this evening that's important in, in approaching this book, and that is a key phrase, a key phrase that occurs nearly 30 times throughout the 12 chapters, and it occurs nowhere else in the Old Testament, this phrase. So uh, when in a 12 chapter book, you have a word or a phrase occurring 30 times or more, and it never occurs in the rest of the vast Old Testament, we ought to sit up and take notice 
That phrase is under the sun. Under the sun. Uh, there's actually a couple of synonymous phrases that occur. Uh, that is, phrases that mean the same thing. They're just using different words. Uh, occur four more times, so we could really get this up to the mid-30s as far as number of occurrences. Uh, the other two phrases are under heaven, chapter 1, verse 13, as an example, under heaven. You can see how that's synonymous with under the sun. And then the phrase on earth, uh, chapter 5, verse 2, is an example where that occurs. And that seems to also be synonymous with under the sun. So under the sun, under heaven, on earth, these these phrases all go together and they dominate the book. And uh, what, what they seem to be doing, what this uh, expression seems to be doing is describing man's search for meaning without God, which of course is futile. Why is this repeated over and over, under the sun, under the sun, under the sun? It seems to be a way of pointing out that this person is searching for meaning in life uh, without God. That is, under the sun, under the heaven, on earth. Um, but and So we might think of the term under the sun being equivalent to without or apart from God. Okay, that helps us understand all this pessimism that we find in the middle part of the book. If all he's doing is looking for meaning without consulting God, no wonder he's frustrated, no wonder he's skeptical, pessimistic. Uh, so that phrase is really important in, in uh, understanding Ecclesiastes. Uh, it's also <laughs> Pardon me. Interesting. Uh, the word, original word that that um, another one that that dominates the book, and it's this word vanity. Okay, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher, as we've read. Um, the word could be translated empty, could be translated futile. It's from the a Hebrew word hevel. Um, the word occurs 38 times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes and, and, and other places. Uh, but it means something like emptiness. It can also be translated vapor. And interestingly, this is actually a person's name in the Old Testament. We have to go all the way back to the beginning, to the opening chapters of Genesis. And you remember... Um, the first murder victim in the history of the world uh, in, in the narrative of scripture. Cain killed his brother Hevel, that is Abel. We know him as Abel. That's Abel's name, which later gets translated vanity, emptiness, vapor, that kind of thing. Sort of fascinating that that's where Abel comes back uh, later on. But this idea of emptiness or vanity, this is what life under the sun amounts to, according to Kohelet, according to the preacher. Uh, you know, he talks about various important topics, pursuing wisdom, pursuing success and wealth and, and influence and that kind of thing. And in the end, he said, it's all vanity, it's all empty, it doesn't mean anything. And so... What is the basic perspective on life that is presented in the book of Ecclesiastes, the main part, the, the body of the book? Uh, to state it quickly, Kohelet says life is full of trouble, then you die. That's in essence what the writer of Ecclesiastes says. Now, I would emphasize it a slightly differently. We might say life under the sun, 
Remember what under the sun means. It means without God. God is in heaven, so life under heaven, life under the sun, life on earth is full of trouble, then you die. That's the basic perspective of the main voice of the book of Ecclesiastes. That's why this book sounds so strange and at times unorthodox and contradictory to other things we read. You know, he says it doesn't matter if you're wise or foolish. You're all going to die. We're all going to the same place. You hear the pessimism, uh, the, the skepticism in that. This is what life under the sun, that is life without God, is like. And that's how I think we can understand and appreciate this, uh, this material, this strange material. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind because oftentimes I hear us, and it's a great temptation, uh, I'm sure that I have succumbed to as a preacher and teacher, and that is to pull verses out of Ecclesiastes, out of this middle part where this guy is pursuing meaning without God, to pull verses out of this part and present them as, uh, as wise truth, godly truth, when really it's something he was pursuing without reference to God. I think of the great uh, verses there in chapter 3. For everything, there is a time. Uh, you remember that passage? I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. A time to be born is a time to die. Uh, for everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Okay, there's our important ver phrase, under heaven, which is parallel to under the sun, which is parallel to on earth. We need to keep in mind that's where we find that text and, and consider that when we're presenting it. Uh, so, very interesting, different, uh, fascinating approach to wisdom. And uh, one of the things we'll look at next time, looking a little bit more at the text itself, is, is some of the major vanities of life under the sun. What are things that that the Kohelet has discovered are vain, empty? Uh, you know, he, he says things like wisdom, human wisdom, and uh, labor, human labor work, uh, all kinds of things, fame, uh, praise, things that other places in Scripture might say are good things. He says, if they're found only under the sun, uh, they are vain. Uh, but we'll, we'll look at more of that next time. I hope this is a helpful introduction. Uh, we'll get us thinking a little bit and get, help you read uh, these, these texts better. That's really my goal. My goal isn't to, to read everything for you and tell you exactly what to, to feel about it, but to equip you to be able to read better and to ap apply better. So thank you for tuning in. Hope you have a great evening. Um, great rest of the week. Looking forward to seeing you on the Lord's Day this week. God bless.